great amount of Hello, everyone, and welcome to this webinar. We're really excited to have such a great turnout and a really nice mix of people from the UNH community. Our topic today is innovations in new drug and therapeutics development. It's a very broad topic, so we view this as the start of a discussion, and we will be interested in continuing that discussion beyond this webinar. I wanted to let you know that the chat is disabled, but you can submit questions through the Q&A function on using that button, Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. What we'll be doing is we'll be capturing those questions and we've got two great members of the UNH team who will be checking those questions. And as we go along, we will do our best to answer any uh, urgent questions that you have as we go through things. And then we'll leave some time at the end of the conversation to try to cover as many questions as possible. So let's dive right in. So I will introduce myself and then have the panelists introduce themselves. It's really a fantastic panel. I'm sure you've read their bios, but there's a lot more to them than just what their bios say. So I'm Christine Carberry. I am a Colsa alum and uh, very active in the UNH community. My career was in biopharma. I spent uh, over 25 years at Biogen and then at a few other companies after Biogen. And currently I'm working and consulting with some emerging biopharmas and working with them on how to grow and how to navigate the alliances they have in drug development, which is a really interesting um, area. And I will bring some of that to our discussion today. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Arthur to introduce himself. Great. Thanks, Christine. Uh, hi, everybody. Arthur Zianibis, uh, President and CEO of Homology Medicines. This is a genetic medicines company that really is looking to provide potential cures to patients living with rare genetic disorders. Uh, and we've launched the company about five years ago. We're uh, almost now uh, to the point where we have three clinical trials this year planned, and we've got a lead program for a disease called PKU. So I've spent about 15 years in the biopharm uh, industry, uh, previously with Shire for almost 10 years, which is another rare disease company. And prior to that, actually spent 15 years in academia. So after leaving UNH as, with my PhD in microbiology, I joined uh, Harvard Med Med Medical School on the faculty there and really had the perspective of trying to drive translation of cutting edge science uh, to patients and uh, learned a lot there, collaborated with a lot of companies and ultimately made the decision I could get things done a lot quicker if I just cut the middleman out and moved right into industry. So that's, that's my story. Wonderful. Great. Thanks, Arthur. Shireen. You need to take yourself off mute. <laughs> Thanks, Christine. No problem. <laughs> um, I just realized I'm the only non-UNH alumni, but I'm a current UNH member. Um, I'm Shireen El Sawa. I'm an associate professor of immunology at UNH. Uh, in my lab, we have an interest in understanding inflammation um, in both normal immune responses and in cancer. And our goal is really to facilitate the development of new therapies for cancer patients based on a fundamental understanding of the basic biology or the basic science that's happening. And I'm very passionate about research, and I love to get undergraduate and graduate students as excited about research as I am. That's great. So glad to have you here. And David. Thanks, Christine. Um, welcome to everybody for joining. We are thrilled with the participation. Uh, I am, as you saw in my bio, the uh, co-founder and chair and CEO of Elevate Bio. We are a uh, cell and gene therapy technology company. Uh, that is focused on powering transformative cell and gene therapies forward uh, today and for many decades to come. Uh, our fundamental approach is that we're in the earliest days of the cell and gene therapy revolution. There's been wonderful, wonderful clinical outcomes observed for a few products, um, but we're really in first generation technology and what we're looking to do at Elevate is to really um, develop a, a lot of next generation technologies that can make these therapies more accessible for more patients and for more diseases. Um, we also uh, want to manufacture all of the products in which our technologies power. So we have a, a quite a breadth of uh, manufacturing infrastructure uh, that we've established. And then we are developing selectively our own therapeutics as well. 
Uh, one of our companies, Alovir, is uh, now in clinical development uh, in both phase three and proof of concept studies across two different cell therapies. It's a virus specific T cell company, which is uh, timely given the fact that we're all living within the pandemic. Prior to Elevate, uh, I was um, I, having been in the industry for about 30 years, uh, I've been at uh, uh, biotech companies like Amgen, which I'm sure many of you had heard about. Uh, they're one of the first and most prominent biotech companies, and they remain independent today uh, and the largest in the industry. I, like Christine, spent some time at Biogen and also spent more than a decade at Alexion, where much like Author at, at Shire, we were very focused on patients with uh, rare, severe, and debilitating uh, conditions. Looking forward to our conversation today. Thank you. As you can hear, there's a lot of um, <clears throat> experience and a lot of passion around this topic. So we're going to dive right in. So the first question is a bit of kind of looking back. And this is an area where uh, every company wants to make drug development better, you know, go faster, have it get to patients sooner, uh, improve the probability of success, keep costs under control. And that has proven very, very difficult. And so the first question is really why? Why has it been so difficult to accelerate drug development and improve our probabilities of success? Arthur, I'd like you to lead us out on that one. Sure. And, and I think this is a great and timely question to, to open up uh, this conversation with, because, you know, we, we ask this question all the time of ourselves, why can't we do things faster and more efficiently? And here we are now, uh, with the COVID-19 vaccines, uh, you know, having taken, you know, about nine months to 12 months to, uh, to roll out to, to, to the general population. And it's really like, why, why is, why is it taking us, you know, 10 years for some drugs and, and less than a year from, for others. And I think, there's a number of factors here, and I'm, and I'm sure my uh, my esteemed uh, co-panelists will opine as well. But you know, from my perspective, in the old days, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you really took a shotgun approach at trying to solve a disease. So you had literally millions of compounds that you would sift through to get to uh, one compound that you wanted to take forward into preclinical development uh, and non-clinical development, clinical trials, and beyond. It would take you a long time to figure out whether that drug was gonna work or not, because not a lot was understood about the biology of disease. But as we progressed, technology has improved, our knowledge of you know, the etiology of diseases has improved. Now we can be much more targeted that we understand really, and this came with you know, really the genomic revolution and understanding the human genome. Now we have a much better idea of why certain diseases um, develop. And in some cases, it's right down to a single gene. So when you have that ability to, to really target specifically, and as we move from small molecules to biologics, you really had the ability to target specific diseases that you knew exactly what the underlying cause of disease is. So I think the probabilities of, of success have improved over time, um, and it, but it's still a bit of a slog. And, and, and some of the reasons for that slog, I would say is, regulatory hurdles um, that have become more complicated with the FDA and other regulatory authorities. And I would also say that, you know, some of this is related to manufacturing. And I know this is something David uh, will definitely focus on with, with his new uh, company, uh, which is really revolutionizing how we think about manufacturing. It's something that really does slow things down, particularly when you're talking about complex biologics manufacturing. It's one of the reasons why we at Pomology Medicines built our own internal manufacturing facility to have control over our own destiny. And, and that's important in terms of being able to move things along. If you're dependent on third parties, um, that becomes somewhat of a rate limiter uh, in terms of your timelines. They can sit right on your timeline and you run into a, a, a huge snag and there's nothing you can do about it. And there's nothing more frustrating uh, than that. And I think. Lastly, I'll finish with, I think right now we're in a just renaissance era of technologies. You have new technologies that we're, we're learning about. There's a steep learning curve there. Um, and, and it's taking a while for us to kind of master uh, gene therapy, cell therapy, um, and, and get that to the point where we're, we're seeing drug approvals. Right now, we've been doing gene therapy for you know, close to 30 years. Right now, there's two drugs approved, Luxterna and Zolgensma. 
So there'll, there's, there's more coming, but it's going to take a while for us to get there. So I think that's part of the challenge as well. That's great. Really hit on a number of key points re regarding, you know, why it's been difficult, the approach that was taking and how we're really migrating to a much more targeted approach uh, to how we identify drugs, develop them and get them to the right patients. David, why don't you build on that? Yeah, th thanks, Christine and, and, and author for uh, really um, covering so many key elements here. Um, first, I'd say uh, for author and I and, and operating and, and leading some of these companies, uh, it's a really tough business. Uh, and it, it's a tough business because uh, oftentimes in any other industry, it generally comes down to a lot of execution risk uh, for a company to be successful. And in our, in our industry, there's a lot of scientific and, and clinical risk um, that comes along with it. So sort of biology and, and, and science needs to cooperate. And then there's all that other stuff, right? Like, like author said, like working with regulators and understanding like who your review team is at the FDA and working with your supply chain and your manufacturing partners and all of the, there's just an enormous amount of, of uh, challenges associated with, with drug development. Um, and, and what I would also say is that while we have a free market here in the U.S., and in many cases outside of the U.S., uh, healthcare is government funded. Uh, and uh, so there's a, a, a lot of considerations as one thinks about developing things for rare diseases or like author at homology globally for a patient population and, and all of the other regulators to work with. While we have a free market, the government still does regulate, which obviously it's one of the most regulated industries in the world at the FDA. I do think there is some elements, as author said, in this renaissance stage where there's so much going on with drug development. I, I do wonder and, and worry that the FDA hasn't scaled with so many drugs moving into clinical development. And as a result, there is just, believe it or not, boring, typical, perfunctory time delays just because review teams at the FDA are so overstretched. So if author or I have a key question about one of our development programs that we wanna ask the FDA, there are formal meeting requests that one makes Oftentimes it's a, a month to realize, to recognize if you even have a meeting and then two to three months after that before you even get that meeting, in which case we, we send the FDA reams of data in a, in a briefing book for that meeting. In and of itself, I think as author said, we've seen this breakneck speed of clinical development for COVID-19 and yet you know we see breakthroughs in early stage trials and yet the population doesn't ever dream of getting one of those drugs for five or 10 years later. And so some of this is just perfunctory. The other thing I would say is, um, and, and, and I don't know, many of our panelists must be very interested in our industry. And, and again, it's wonderful to see almost 200 people here today. Um, but has anybody read Walter Isaacson's new book on Jennifer Dowd and, and, and gene editing? And, and one of the things that he talked about was really the three uh, biggest inventions of our time are the atom, because that's where nuclear power went in society, uh, the bit, which has opened us up to tech and the internet, and the third one is the gene. And, and obviously we're in the, as, as author was saying, like there's so much now being developed for targeted treatments where we were at blunt, we were in much more blunter sort of instruments before to just try to have a chemical effect in the body. And I think it's a little bit of a blessing and a curse. There's so much value to harness and understanding the gene and how to get even away from treatments and maybe move to cures. But anytime one thinks about um, sort of knocking in or knocking out a gene, there's also the ethical implications, the safety implications, and there is no kind of getting that genie back in the bottle. So we're super excited about this new generation of technology, and yet what comes with it is a lot of fear, and I think adequate fear amongst regulators, the FDA, the European Medicines Agency, and others, about the safety implications of some of these targeted therapies as well. And I think that we need a little bit of time, I think we need more staff at these agencies and I think we need a little bit more time to understand the longer term implications. The final point I'll make, sorry, and then bring Shireen in. You know, when, when a disease has, a, a, you know, sort of an acceptable treatment that's relatively 
um, sort of efficacious and safe, the bar is higher for a new modality to actually clear with regulators. So that's the other thing, like hypertension, diabetes, cholesterol, like as some of these diseases get commonly treated with small molecules, where there are just tens of years, hundreds of patient years really in sort of safety data, and then one wants to correct it with a new modality, generally the ask is even much higher by regulators to know that these things are safe. And author, for you and me, right, in gene therapy, we just saw this happen real time with hemophilia. In the hemophilia market, there are injectables being used to manage these patients who have a very severe sort of bleed out disease, right? Because they're, they're lacking certain factors uh, in their blood system. And, and we saw all this incredible, promising, corrective gene therapy development in the area of hemophilia. And what we just saw for any number of companies is they were put on a two to four year longer timeline for ever getting these gene therapies out for hemophilia. And that's because the regulators see that there are some things with more of a known longer term profile that is kind of managing these patients. And so the ask gets to be that much greater. So those are some other implications for us to think about as well. Sorry for the long drawn out answer. I'll hand it back to Christine. And no, no, it's, it's now, so others can actually talk. <laughs> no, great, great point. And I think if people haven't gotten the sense that there's a wide range of challenges <laughs> in drug development, Shireen will top it off with a cherry and uh, <laughs> as, as it relates to the type of work that she does. So Shireen, um, if you unmute yourself and what, um, what would you like to add to this conversation? So, I mean, David brings in some excellent points. I think I'm going to take a step back from where David and Arthur are at and say, if you think about when, you know, with a, with a simple drug that's discovered, you're going to try it. We try it first in the lab in a, in a flask with one cell, and then we try it with cells from patients. And then we're going to try it in, a, in an in vivo model because in a, in a dish in the lab, all I have is that one cell type. But in humans, what happens is you have a lot of things that are happening all together. So we have to think about that. We try it in animal models, and then we try to test it in humans. So the process of testing the drug in a preclinical setting way before it gets to a clinical setting is also a very long one. It takes time, and it's hard to find the right models. And once you get to the human trials, there are a lot of things that are happening that are very different from what we studied in the lab. And that's information that also adds to the regulatory uh, process as well. Great, thank you. Um, so with that as a backdrop, kind of here are all these challenges. There, There's reason to be hopeful, right? <laughs> We're not trying to paint a picture that there isn't reasons to believe that things will continue to get better. And um, so let's turn to that. And so the second question is really, how does new technologies and approaches and something we haven't touched too much on yet about new types of collaborations that are happening how is that changing drug, drug, drug development? Where are the opportunities? Um, David, I'd like you to start us out on this one. Great. A um, cu couple of points I'll make and, and try not to be as, as long-winded as the last one. But uh, first and foremost, I, I think Arthur and I often are probably frustrated in, in our roles and, and how slow regulators can be. They have taken some steps recently to try to call out those programs that are in very high need for uh, a disease that otherwise patients have no other hope. Um, they've established um, certain types of programs like a fast track designation, uh, perhaps a breakthrough therapy designation, which basically means you should have, <laughs> I lived through this, more rapid access to the agency. But, you know, by, by, by the way, Timex measures time, I don't even think it's that rapid. But nonetheless, they are trying to find, you know, ways, accelerated approvals, as we saw with COVID 19. EUA access to things like uh, vaccines and, and, and therapies. And, and yet I, I, I do fear, right, that, that even like yesterday's news about the J&J &J vaccine, people will ask the question, is this what happens when we rush things through a little bit? Uh, you know, we're talking about patients between the age of 18 and 48 um, who are generally um, not at risk for the worst outcomes associated with COVID-19, and yet a few individuals unfortunately received a vaccine that created a, uh, a life-threatening blood clot. 
And, and so um, how does one think about, and, and, and it is interesting, and I think it's a good thing on the new technology and new modality side that Arthur and I generally are close to the messenger RNA approaches, which are a bit more targeted than the traditional approaches when one is actually introducing some pieces of the virus. And it's been nice to see, you know, with now hundreds of millions of people um, dosed with the mRNA vaccines, um, that those are, are actually having quite a favorable um, safety profile. Um, so I, I do think that targeted treatments uh, are, are, are a very, very promising approach. I do think with any treatment, off-target effects becomes the new kind of risk. Like if I've augmented one's DNA, what does that mean uh, for uh, that person or generations to come uh, from the recipient? I think about this too, because I'm in an allogeneic cell therapy space. Um, and for our audience, what that means is we take cells from um, uh, one donor uh, and, and, and we give them, we, we kind of partially match them for another donor to either fight viral infections and or cancer. It's a very promising area. Um, and yet everybody's greatest fear is um, can you turn the cells off if they start attacking something other than the virus or the cancer cells? And so, so, so these things are, are, are certainly on the top of, of, of all of our minds. But what I would say is that I do see an incredibly collaborative environment. Um, Arthur and I, if you read about our companies, you'll see our science comes out of world leading cancer centers or academic centers where these academic centers are developing now a playbook um, for uh, uh, really interpreting translational research and moving it rapidly into sort of monetization and commercialization. Um, so I do think that those partnerships, and that's a topic we'll get to later, um, are really helping. I also think that um, we are becoming better at understanding what the regulators are, are looking for. Um, so in other words, whenever you're submitting something to the agency, there's this whole big manufacturing piece and they do want to know that the manufacturing process is super tight with a high level of quality associated with the system, especially when you're providing a living drug like a cell therapy, these things are great asks or some kind of genetic material. Um, and so I, th I think that that's a key piece. I think the other thing is, as author was saying, like when you have a better understanding of sort of the underlying cause of the disease and you develop a more targeted treatment, it becomes a bit easier to sort of define a clinically meaningful endpoint that might make a difference to actually get one over the line um, and actually get a drug to patients uh, who are in need. And so I, I do think as we get cleaner molecules or cleaner approaches, that should be a straighter shot for drug development. Um, and then it just gets down to execution, as I say, enough sites, enough investigators, enough patients enrolled, and then good biostats. You know, everyone needs a biostats plan because what makes drug development, you know, if you haven't thought it's hard so far, the, the P value of 0 0.05 is not the easiest thing in the world to hit because the regulators want to know that you didn't see a drug effect by chance. And so that p-value is absolutely critical that you need to be in a 97%, uh, 95 or greater percent likelihood that what you're observing in the trial is due to the intervention. And so I do think all of these things are getting better for us. And I'm, I'm certainly very optimistic about it. And then the last thing I'll say is what COVID-19 has showed us is when there is a desire amongst governments, amongst academic centers, amongst pharmaceutical companies, to like get there faster, more faster, we can do it. So I think that's the example that we can do it. The question is now, what does it take when you wrap in beyond a pandemic, right? When you wrap in cancer, when you uh, wrap in rare genetic diseases, when you wrap in chronic long-term diseases, how can we get there faster across the board? And, and hopefully there will be a lot of key learnings from the COVID-19 drug development uh, experience that will help us all out in non-COVID-19 diseases. Wonderful. Great, David. And that fits nicely into, you know, the science coming from um, academia and how you leverage that. So Shireen, I'd like you to add in on what you're seeing that's changing that can uh, lead to some improvements in, in, dr in drug development. I think one of the important things that we saw with the COVID-19 um, vaccines is there was a lot more transparency and a lot more sharing of information. 
between scientists, between companies, where everybody came together for the common goal, partly because everybody was stuck at home and we didn't have an out, so everybody wanted to get out of the house, but we really didn't see the competition that normally exists, you know, no cutthroat competition in terms of getting the scientific information out and no cutthroat approaches and trying to get the vaccine out um, before this company beats me and so on. And so I think that was one of the most important things that allowed us to be successful in getting the COVID-19 vaccine out. So hopefully from this point on, we'll see more cooperation between scientists more cooperation between companies, more cooperation between academia and industry to facilitate the development of other therapies for other diseases as well. Great, really great point. And we are seeing that and we're seeing how it can really impact things when we're partnering and not competing, right? Yes. Um, with, with each other. Arthur, what do you wanna to add to this piece of the conversation? Um, I think you need to unmute yourself. There we go. Uh, great points by David and Shireen. I, I think I'd pick up on two strands there. The first, uh, you know, again, back to COVID-19. If you think about the mRNA story, and, and David is very familiar with this uh, from his days at Alexion, and I was from my days at Shire. You know, I mean, this is a technology that's been around for 25 years or so. And, and really the ability to kind of figure out where can I best use that technology and how can we develop that um, in a way that's going to be most effective? And really, and originally it was thought, you know, let's do chronic treatment weekly, every other week, monthly. But the issue there is the, uh, the safety signals that you get from the lipid nanoparticle delivery system that's required. And so really, you know, that kind of led uh, Moderna uh, and others to maybe this is a vaccine approach where you need to only give one, maybe two, maybe three uh, doses, and you don't have that build up. So I think, you know, when we look back at what just happened to us and, and what's going to kind of continue to happen over the next year to two years, we're going to, that's a story that should be written um, up and, and studied as a case study of how science works and how collaboration and partnerships should work. And, and to Shireen's point around the openness around which the data were shared, how quickly we we're able to move, having the government behind you really funding uh, all of that work, the clinical trial uh, work. I mean, that work was Herculean in terms of what got done in terms of the clinical trial. So I think there's a lot of lessons there to be learned across drug development, which is great. I think the second point is around collaborations and partnerships. Um, that could, you know, continue to fuel innovation, and 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 I'm talking about between universities and and industry, and we'll get to that uh, a little bit later. But also, I, I think the larger companies, the the big pharma companies, big biotech, their ability to kind of help nurture um, funding for you know academic basic science, which is really the, the true innovation and true engine. Uh, for, for all of drug development and the ability for larger companies to help smaller companies. I mean, we had uh, a relationship um, equity investment from Pfizer through their breakthrough fund, basically making an equity investment in homology to, to really help us develop uh, our PKU uh, gene therapy and gene editing programs. So, so those kind of um, opportunities, I think the more of those that we have, you'll see the pace of drug development pick up. Uh, and I think that's also an important aspect of, of trying to get to the goal line uh, a lot quicker. Absolutely, great point. So there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful about where we're headed with all of, all of this new technologies, more openness, more open innovation, more collaboration. And another part that I, I know people uh, that are participating or interested in is how technology is playing into it. That was another thing that was really um, highlighted in the COVID-19 vaccine clinical trials that uh, they were using a lot of technology to understand what was going on with patients. They were doing things like 
having uh, people go out to patients' houses to give them their, their shots, not having to come into clinics. So did things in a very different way. And uh, I, I agree that, you know, this is not about going back to the old normal. It's about creating a better new normal and really leveraging everything that we've learned. And, and I think there'll be more than one book, Arthur, that'll be, <laughs> be written on this, on this topic for sure. I'm seeing some good questions come in, but we have one more question that I think would be good to have the panelists talk to uh, before we get into the specific questions you have um, submitted to us. So the final th third question for us to get into is to now think about those collaborations and more specifically, how a top research university like the University of New Hampshire and R1 Carnegie Research Institute, how can they engage with the biopharma community and how can we really create the collaborations that lead to uh, leveraging the expertise everybody has and translating that into application that really helps patients. So Shireen, you, you seem like the logical person for us to start with um, on that question. So this is an excellent point, Christine. You know, at UNH, we train the next generation of scientists, both at the undergraduate and graduate um, level. And so we teach them in courses, we teach them in the lab, we teach them in research laboratories. And so a better understanding of what the industry needs, the biotech industry needs, will help us better prepare them for those kinds of careers in research. Um, the other thing too that's important to mention is understanding the strengths of each organization. So what we do as an academic institute is going to be different than what uh, a company does. The costs of doing it at an academic institute versus the costs of doing it in a company are also going to factor in. So I think better uh, a network of better connection between academics and industry will help us prepare the next generation of scientists for what they need to do really once they leave um, uh, the, the university level. It's a really great point. And I was thinking of that as we were going through all the challenges. I hope we're not scaring off any of the students <laughs> and, and people early in their career thinking, why do I want to get in biopharmaceuticals? I think we can all attest it's a really uh, um, amazingly difficult and rewarding uh, field to be in for sure. So thanks, Shireen. Um, Arthur, please add to, to this conversation. Yeah, sure. And you know, I, I feel like I've been on both sides of this equation uh, over my 30 plus years in the business, you know, half of it in academia and half of it in industry. But, you know, to my way of thinking, it's really important that we leverage the basic research that's going on in, in universities like UNH uh, and, and, and convert that into really meaningful uh, treatments. And, and you know, to your point, Christine, about scaring people off, I mean, I can't think of a more noble mission uh, than trying to save somebody's life or cure them of a, of a terrible disease. I mean, I, you know, waking up every day, I'm rushing into the office because that's really what's driving me. And that's the message I'm sending to everybody at my company. And I'm sure you're going to hear that from Shereen and you're going to hear that from David as well. And, and so that mission is, is really important and, and a noble one. And, and I think that, you know, if I look in, in my career uh, of drugs that I've worked on, uh, some have failed, uh, some of, you know, are in patients now, um, th there's no better feeling than seeing uh, your drug that you worked on get to uh, patients and help them. And, and, and really the basic science, I, almost in every case, you know, during my Shire days, we would always work with the key uh, experts in academia on a particular disease, get their opinions, um, understand the research, fund them, because we thought they were best suited to be able to bring that, um, that, that knowledge to our ability to then translate that to a drug that can be tested in a clinical trial. And I, I can't think of too many drugs where it was a completely homegrown you know, internal effort that got us from the beginning all the way to the end. And so, you know, from our perspective, it's a really important part of the drug development process. And then I would add um, the talent. So, you know, I look at, you know, 
graduates of UNH uh, from Colsa, and, and I, I, I know they're going to be highly trained. I know they're going to be, you know, able to hit the ground running. I know they know how to use a pipette right out of the gate, and I know they know how to design and execute on an experiment. They're just extremely well trained, and I think there is a real shortage um, of of talent right now in biotech, um, and and you know people that are one, two, three years out of a bachelor's from, uh, from UNH right now are able to almost command uh, almost any price they want uh, in, in the industry. It's highly competitive um, and people hop around. I noticed, David, you've got a couple of my people jumping into your company. So we'll have a chat about that later. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but because it's a great company and and so you have that option you can move around and, and figure out what is what it is that you really latch on to in science so i think that's the other part of the um the academic industry uh component and i should mention that our company homology was founded um and uh co-founder uh was in her postdoc at city of hope hospital in pasadena and she was employee number five of the company, and she's been with us for five years now, Laura Smith. So, you know, I mean, you can see a discovery you make and follow it all the way into the point where that discovery becomes a real um, clinical trial and a potential uh, drug that's gonna be approved by FDA. So that's really exciting. I, I think it, this is an area that we need to really um, continue to foster and continue to grow in terms of the academic uh, industry uh, relationship. Absolutely. And one of the things that came up when we were preparing the panel is this uh, this belief or conception that, you know, that, that the science that happens and research that happens in industry is happening on the dark side, you know, and, and that, that only in an academic setting is true research happening. And I think we're shifting that perception so people understand good research is good research, regardless of who's doing it and where it's happening. And I think that's also getting people to see some of the value of collaborating. And we're not two different things. We are doing different things, but they can help each other. So so David, um, why don't why don't you add your thoughts to this? Yeah, thanks. Uh, a lot has been covered uh, by Shireen and, and, and Arthur, and I agree. I mean, we've started. Um, you know, I mentioned Alavir. That company was started with the Baylor College of Medicine. Um, we've started a few companies with the Fred Hutch out in Seattle, um, and then we have some other academic partners, and have even started a company based on uh, a license from the National Institutes of Health. So. Um, clearly, uh, this uh, is a tremendous opportunity for everybody to understand that, first and foremost, most of our innovation comes out of private and public uh, uh, research universities. And what we need to do is understand how we can, in the industry, work with research organizations uh, like, like uh, UNH to accelerate the innovation. I, I mean, one of the concerns I've all you know, always had, I've sometimes said, you know, it's trapped innovation because these poor universities are fighting for, I mean, we talk about the backlog with the FDA. How about the endless amount of grant writing that is required for poor, you know, for scientists, right, who have great ideas. And it's, it's the endless grant writing. And author, I know you can laugh about this because it's like endless grant writing is your source of funding when you could actually be advancing an exciting platform forward. So one of the things we're, you know, very much like, you know, author started with technology out of City of Hope, which is the world's, you know, one of the world's greatest institutions. Um, you know, we, we do very much the same. We look to identify like really exciting technology that we, we feel like is, is sort of trapped innovation in some of these research labs. And if we can overcome the grant and we actually provide the grant, can we actually accelerate the innovation and move it through the preclinical and into the clinical setting uh, more rapidly. Makes a lot of sense to do that. Um, Author nailed all the things about, and I'm glad, Christine, you said, let's not make it seem so dour. Um, because I think one of the things we all need to realize, um, um, I think Author was referring, when I was the CEO of Alexion, we had, we had an agreement with Moderna uh, for chronic rare diseases of the mRNA technology. And what we learned as we moved into closer to clinical development is that the body responded. Uh, there was an immune response to this, this treatment and therefore they were not 
really amenable to chronic treatments. But, but let's just realize this in science. That's why it's science. The failures make the successes. We got to celebrate the failures just as much as we celebrate the successes because the failures open up doors to what the new successes will be. And in this case, and there are any number of examples of that, including the mRNA technology where the path to chronic treatments was not there, but it opened the door to this might be the ideal platform for sort of a one and done with the immunogenic sort of properties of the, of the, of the therapy could be an ideal sort of vaccine platform. And here we are today, you know, just a year after everybody shutting their doors down now kind of seeing a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, so it's very exciting. And I, and I, and I think author, you nailed it. I mean, for folks to dedicate their careers starting in, in, in a research setting, um, there will be endless opportunities in an in industry that is growing uh, beyond that of, of, of most others. And, um, and there's tremendous optionality uh, for career growth. The last thing I'll say, which I've been very focused on is, you know, the tech industry has had it right. And sometimes the California institutions have had it a little bit more right than the others where Stanford and, and Caltech and, and, and Berkeley, like they just had these like outside in thinking about ways that their faculty could monetize their tech, you know, sort of their technologies. And I'm actually going through this with Harvard right now where they recognize like they will either I mean, for these research universities, a way to retain your best staff and attract your best staff is to have great, figure out a way to have great relationships with industry because it will make life an awful lot better in terms of the funding that comes into the labs and the opportunity to commercialize or monetize and commercialize uh, the, the inventions. And so I, I think it's one of those things to, the innovation comes out of the labs, but to really scale, you need sort of all those scalable sort of features around manufacturing. I mean, author, we came into Alavir because the folks at Baylor College of Medicine said, we don't have a global manufacturing infrastructure and we don't have a cl global clinical development infrastructure. We've done most of our things in just a few clinical trial sites. And I think it's an awareness of understand who does what really well and let's match up a couple of parties where they bring what they do really well to the table. And I think we can really accelerate innovation uh, with that kind of a partnership. Really great um, discussion going on here. And we have a lot of great questions that I'm seeing in the Q&A. So now that we've kind of covered a bit of the landscape of why has it been so hard? What's changing? How are we innovating? How do we create better collaborations where there were more borders than, than uh, collaboration and openness? So um, to the people who submitted questions, thank you so much. They are all really wonderful. In the interest of time, I'm gonna try to maybe paraphrase a little and I hope I do not in any way um, diminish your question. And if you think I get it wrong, please just put another question in there. But the first question was really around quality. With the increase of demand for getting drugs to patients faster, um, how, and you, the panelists have talked about the really high standards we have and the increasing standards in which we have, what are the safeguards or how do we protect, I guess you'd say, um, from having different standards in different places in terms of uh, making sure that drugs that do get to patients are safe and effective. So I don't know um, who would I'll like- start. I'll start. Oh, okay, David, uh, jump right in. Because you know, I think there's a, there's a quick way to, because I'd like to get to all the questions. It's really quick. Um, the FDA just doesn't approve those therapies. <laughs> I mean, the end of the day is the FDA carries the big hammer because whatever they ask for, given the fact that this is the most lucrative pharmaceutical market in the world, whatever they ask for is a quality metric that needs to be met, is a quality ask that needs to be met. Otherwise, one is turning their back on the US. So that's why China and Russia have their own vaccines and, and, and maybe some other developing countries might take those vaccines in because um, nobody would take them in in Europe, Japan, or Korea, or the US, right? So there's, there's regulatory authorities like the FDA, like the European Medicines Agency, like PMDA in Japan, 
and what used to be KFDA in Korea that sort of have what I would call, you know, sort of acceptable measures. But the FDA carries all the weight. You, one needs to meet those standards or the drug will forget about never be approved here. It will never even be tested in this country. They Remember, the FDA needs to approve a trial to even move into clinical uh, uh, into the clinical setting, into patients uh, in U.S. borders. So right from the start, they have all of the leverage there. Great. Anything the other panelists would like to add before I move to the next question? I'm good. That's, okay. It nailed it. <laughs> Great. Okay. So the, our second question is, what is being developed for improved clinical administration to target the cells of interest for various types of indications. So it, it, it really gets at how, how do we make sure the drugs are getting to the cells we want them to get to? Um, uh, Arthur, maybe, I mean, you're focused a lot on delivery these days. Do you want to start there and then maybe, I'm yeah. sorry, Christine, I'm not the moderator, but I was just. <laughs> it's absolutely the, like, fine. We'll let uh, Arthur take broad, the lead on this. <laughs> but he's got a very broad platform and he's, he's, he's identifying indications and delivery is, is something I'm sure he always thinks about. Perfect. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And it's something, you know, where it, one of the things that attracted me to the technology that we have is the fact that we have a diverse uh, kind of library of these viral vectors that will carry the, the drug, in this case, it's the cDNA for gene therapy or gene editing to specific targets. And we can kind of select which of these particular vectors are gonna target, let's say the heart, or let's say skeletal muscle or cross the blood brain barrier. So, so we have that diversity within our library of, of capsids and vectors that, that allow us to kind of to, to do that kind of targeting. But I'm sure, um, and I'll throw it over to Shireen, I'm sure that in the lab, you guys are working on uh, assays and different techniques to be able to kind of assess this at the, at, the, uh, at the in vitro or in vivo level. And that is also really important in the, in the process of drug development. So, you know, in terms of targeting things to specific cells, we could do this with animal models. So, you know, we know how to remove a gene from a specific cell type. We know how to insert a gene into a specific cell type and have a whole animal that actually expresses that gene only in this cell or doesn't express it only in this cell. And this allows us to really know the function of that gene. So similar things can be done in humans. And with, with um, I'm gonna talk about cancer therapy because that's my, my expertise. You know, there are some cancers that express things on their surface that are very different from other cells. So if we know that, then we could target the therapies to those cells. So, but the, the key point is if we know what those cancer, cancer cells look like that it makes them different from normal cells. Right. David, did you want to add anything to that before we go to the next question? No? Okay. So the next, there's actually a couple questions that get to this one, which is really about the cost of um, these very specialized uh, treatments. And, uh, you know, is it really uh, sustainable to have drugs that are so expensive um, for these treatments? And so, um, David, I'm going to I'm going to ask you to start on that one. Yeah, a couple of things, maybe a good place to start, right? I mean, a lot of people are working from home. Just think about the days of the first flat screen TV. <clears throat> think about the days when you carried around a $3,000 bag phone that was your first <laughs> cell phone that would like break your shoulder. Um, the, the fact is, it, it's probably not always going to be this way. But as author said, after 20, 30 years of development, the, I think what I saw online, the questions about Zolgensma for SMA, Luxturna for a very, very rare uh, uh, inherited retinal disease uh, that impacts, you know, maybe a few thousand people worldwide. Um, and then um, what was the, oh, the, the, the third was Chemraya uh, for uh, a CAR-T for uh, acute lymphocytic leukemia. Uh, and, and I think large B cell lymphoma is another indication that they're looking at there. The fact, believe it or not, I mean, I'll, I'll say the, the hard thing because I don't represent any of these countries. None of these companies are really making money on these three drugs. In fact, they're thinking about, uh, they just don't know because these are one-time treatments, they're cures. Uh, nobody's ever seen this in the pharmaceutical industry before because when 
your mom or your dad or, or we take our medicines, you usually take them chronically and you kind of build on a business over, and nobody's really figured out what, how disruptive from a pricing perspective, a one-time cure is and how one monetizes that. Um, now, somebody is paying for these. Why are they paying for these? Well, in the case of um, uh, Luxturna, Chemriah and Zolgensma. First of all, worldwide, there are very few patients that even get these therapies. So any insurer or any government has, you know, basically a very acceptable on aggregate for the population, a small budget impact. These tend to be very big on the per patient costs, very small on their overall budget. And when you're talking about SMA, which is a, an infant born with spinal muscular atrophy, uh, is very unlikely to have you know, a, a good outcome in life. Um, and is it uh, really uh, severe and, and Camraya for, you know, it's life or death with acute lymph lymphocytic leukemia. The fact is society pays and it's a lot per patient, but it's, it's very, very little from a budget perspective. And again, like those old bag phones, like your flat screen TVs, like anything else from a technology perspective, the computers we're all looking on today, um, it's one of the things homology is focused on. It's one of the things Elevate's doing with its enabling technologies. We're trying to do things better, faster, and cheaper. And that, that I guess these questions are so good because that's what I meant in my intro, that we're trying to make cell and gene therapies more accessible to more patients. That isn't just because of clinical success. Through manufacturing technologies, if we can actually figure out a way to do this better, faster, cheaper, then the prices will come down. But there are not, believe it or not, there are not huge margins on these therapies um, outside of even the R&D costs because the manufacturing costs are so much. One dose of Chemriya is about a four to six week process of taking the cells out, sending it to a manufacturing facility, working for four weeks to process them, and then sending them back. It's a one patient at a time treatment. So Anyway, I would say hang in there and recognize that no company will price something at a point in which the insurance companies or the governments refuse to pay. They just won't because they won't have a business. So everything that you see with the headline news of these high price factor, these high costs are generally agreed upon between the pharmaceutical company and, and the government and or insurance company. Author, anything to add? You've got a lot of experience in this space. Well, I, I mean, you covered it, and I don't want to belabor it, but I, I think drug pricing right now is a very hot topic. Uh, I think that I uh, totally agree that if you look at the overall um, cost of treatments for rare genetic disorders, for example, I mean, this is a field that Genzyme opened up, you know, more than 30 years ago, uh, is a very small part of the healthcare budget overall. So while some of these are exorbitantly expensive. As David pointed out, there's very few patients relative to the general population. Um, and, I, and I think that um, we have done a good job of sorting through companies that, that are egregiously raising prices year on year. Uh, and, and I think that's becoming, uh, because they, the spotlight has been shown on them, they've become much more uh, careful about how they go about pricing uh, the same drug from one year to the next. So that's all I can add to that. Great. Um, I, I, the next question is really interesting. So Shireen, if it's okay, I'll just move on to the, the next one. Or did you want to add something no, on the pricing? No, they said it perfectly. Uh, okay. Great. So this is interesting. Um, in terms of the vaccine rollout, you've discussed how the companies and researchers have shared more information with one another for SARS than other diseases in the past. If this is the case, what is the point in developing more options of a vaccine instead of having these competing companies produce the existing ones instead of developing other vaccines with potential side effects? So the way I read that question is, you know, why do we need multiple pro why do we let multiple companies develop multiple products based on um, the information that we're sharing broadly so I see heads heads nodding but Shireen do you have any thoughts on on that why it's important to have multiple companies um, take the science and and develop potentially different products in different ways I mean there are pros and cons to each product right so the mRNA vaccine you need to take it you need two doses. So in terms of manufacturing, you have to produce double the amount um, so that you can give each individual who gets it both doses. 
Whereas the Johnson and Johnson one, it's a, it's a one dose vaccine. Um, the, you know, the Johnson and Johnson, so it's an advantage because a lot of people don't want to go back for a second shot. The other thing about technology is the Johnson and Johnson one is in, in terms of how it's made is very similar to a lot of other vac childhood vaccines that we receive. And so, you know, in a way it's easier and people resort to that. There's some familiarity with it and people who are afraid of the mRNA vaccine may be more amenable to take that vaccine. And so if our goal is to get everybody immunized, then you know, having multiple options available for people would hopefully help us get to the herd immunity faster. Great. Are there anything to add to that? Yeah, I would just add, you know, when you have free enterprise, it usually drives to the best outcome. Uh, and since we're going to, I don't think, <laughs> I don't think this is over, right? So, you know, with the variants coming on board, not understanding the length of immunity that these vaccines are going to provide, I think the more companies that are involved here, um, the better because I think you're gonna end up with the best solution or solutions at the end of the day, you know, different companies, you know, tracking down the different variants from different parts of the world, different companies coming up with, uh, you know, better approaches, safer profiles. I think that's where, you know, having more folks in there uh, competing, if you will, uh, we'll, we'll, you'll end up with the best product uh, from an e efficacy and safety standpoint. Couldn't agree more, I would just add that while we're all feeling a little bit of a sigh of relief here, um, there are countries that are so far away from being vaccinated and that's what Arthur's talking about. It is a, an ideal environment for variants. And remember all the variants today have been basically one single amino acid on the spike protein. When these variants flip, I mean, there are structural and non-structural proteins on, on, on the coronavirus, on COVID-19. If they flip to out of spike into M or N or even the non-structural proteins, I mean, we want Moderna, we want Pfizer, BioNTech, and we want everybody continuing to focus on the innovation and the free market will decide. And I think folks see an opportunity uh, for multiple options. And, and then finally, like, look, not everybody responds the same way to every therapy. And that's why there usually is a class of therapies for patients. And they call them sort of like, I don't want to call them like a tourist, in, in you, but some physicians will start with one, but then move to another finding for the optimal response for a patient. And so optionality is usually a very good thing for society. Wonderful answers and, and perspectives. So I hope that helped answer that question. Um, unfortunately, we are up against our time and I, I, I wish we had more because the rest of the questions are really great. And so they will not be lost. We will definitely uh, factor those into future communications. So with that, I wanna thank the panelists so much. I know that all of you are extremely busy and really took time to prepare. And I, I think it showed and I hope you as participants uh, got what you were hoping to get out of the session. Thank you so much for being part of the UNH community, and we look forward to connecting with you again. Have a wonderful day. Great. Bye, everybody. Bye, everyone.